way who had come out there, I don't know, with a very good band, and whenever that was, I don't know, but probably 1949, 50, somewhere in there, uh, where I became extremely, I mean, some, I'd gone there very high, and uh, liter I literally saw like all kinds of colored flashes, and, and it was at that point that I realized that music could be put to my films. My films had been made before then, those earlier ones, but I'd always shown them silently, because basically what, what that stuff was, was I was, I'd, I'd been interested in sort of Jungian psychiatry when I was in, I don't know when, probably in junior high school, I'd found some books of Jung in the library, and this business about mandalas and so forth got me interested. I would like to say I'm not too interested in Jung anymore, it seems very crude and so forth, but the, uh, that was another thing that figured in there, see. Did you envision any effect the film would have? No, okay, well, okay, it was just a simple uh, attempt to, uh, well, it's be, sort of to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, I didn't even realize until last night that I probably invented op art. I've been a, but there is there there is that one sort of there is that, there is one op art film, the one that has those grill works things in it, uh, which was done in a kind of crude optical printer sort of thing. Uh, and the where the camera came from? Ah, for, first from Frank Stoffiger and then later from somebody named Hi Hirsch, who was uh, working at the, at the time as a... Uh, with Sidney Peterson? He, mm, no, he got involved with Peterson later. I think Peterson, I think his first film, whatever that was, The Potted Song, was made with uh, James Broughton. Yeah. But then I believe later, when uh, Peterson made some kind of a film on the Crawfutal Indians or something, uh, Hi became involved. But he had a pretty good camera, a uh, Bell and Howell model 70-something, but uh, they loaned me. He had seen my films, he'd seen that, that how I met him was at the Tarnasco Museum, they showed that one of the sort of grill works that precedes the circular tension one, and had come up and spoken to me. And then I actually asked me for the camera, because I've never owned a camera, I've always just bought, either bought, usually borrowed one and then pawned it, so that... Uh, I thought it was an embarrassing scene, trying to explain to the person where their camera is, because they invariably think, now, I can remember Frank Stoffaker saying to me, now you haven't pawned the camera, have you? He said this jokingly, except it was pawned. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, that's it. <laughs> but usually people get their cameras back eventually. So that's where, that's where the cameras came from. And then the later ones were made with one that belonged to someone named Sheba Ziprin. Z i p r i n relation to uh, Lionel's approach? Yeah, Lionel's mother, and uh, so that the Mysterioso film and and the uh, that long black and white film were shot on her camera, now, which is now in a, a, a pawn shop in Oklahoma City. The one, that, the main parts of my film in Oklahoma last year were shot on a film a camera that belonged to somebody named Stuart Reed, which is in a barber shop in Anadarko, Oklahoma. Uh, where Mr. Ash's uh, lawn sack also is, unfortunately. But, uh, now, uh, let me ask some questions about the Mysterioso film and, and his version. What made you make the change, in, the complete change in style between those two? Between the early films? Oh, because I hadn't made films for many. See, after I stopped making films, then I made those paintings that where you point at, and unless you've seen some of those, you, it's, it's hard to describe really what they are. They're, at least as good as the films. <coughs> and I may, I'd been able to hear Charlie Parker and, and Thelonious Monk, who had both come to San Francisco <coughs> times around then. But then I wanted to make a, one final thing of another painting of Thelonious. So, or Thelonious. So when I came here, I uh, realized that it was impossible to make it in the form of a painting because his music was fairly complex and it was better to make a film. So, I hadn't made films for maybe five years at that point, but I then, when I made one, it, that, like the one that is shown last night or whenever it was, is, was like a study for this, for the Mysterioso film. Now, the, the imagery of the, of the study, is it, is it a very fixed continuity? Or well, no, I just build up a large number of objects because generally speaking those films were made by trying to collect interesting pictures 
cut them out, and then they were filed. I had enormous files of that stuff, see? Any kind of this, that, and the other thing, in all different sizes. and So that then file cards were made up. For example, everything that was congruent to that black and white film was picked out. Uh, that was at least in that same style. And what sort of a, was there any sort of scenario to the black and white film before? It oh yeah, sure. I mean, that's what I was going into now is how the scenario was made. All the combinations that were possible were built up. Like say, there's a hammer in it, and there's a vase, and there's a woman, and there's a what else is there? A dog. So that various things could then be done. Hammer hits dog, woman hits dog, va dog jumps into vase, uh, so forth. So that then... A, s a story of any sort? No. Then these, this was all written on, on little slips of paper, file cards, the possible combinations between this, that, and the other thing. And then the file cards were then rearranged in an effort to make a logical story out of them. See like certain things would then have to happen before others. I, t I tried as much as possible to make the whole thing like automatic, the, the production of, of those films, rather than any kind of logical process. Uh, although at this point, uh, Allen Ginsberg denies having said that. In several years, some, about the time that I started to make those, he had told me that William Burroughs had made a change in the surrealistic process because of course you know that all that stuff sort of comes from the surrealists mm -hmm. that business of like folding over a piece of paper and one draws the head and then you fold <coughs> over somebody else draws the body method of composition that uh, uh, somebody later uh, probably Burroughs realized that uh, something was directing it that it wasn't arbitrary that there was some kind of uh, what you might call God or it wasn't just chance that some kind of universal processes were directing even these so-called arbitrary processes so that uh, I sort of proceeded on that basis that to try to remove the thing as much as possible from the consciousness or whatever you want to call it so that the like the manual processes uh, could be employed entirely to like moving things around, that ev as much as it was possible was to be made automatic. And I must say, I'm amazed myself when I saw that film last night, that black and white film, how much labor went into it. It just seems like incredible when I looked at the thing that I had ever had enough energy to do that. All the pieces and the script were made for a, m a film at least uh, four times as long as that. Including an art scene at the end. A what scene? Oh, no, the, the Noah's Ark occurs fairly uh, soon after that. There were, like, uh, wonderful uh, masks and things uh, cut out, uh, sort of like in... There were only... A few of them were used in the... Uh, in that Mysterioso film, like radiations and things. And uh, then all sorts of complicated effects, because I'd held all those off, these radiations and stuff. Uh, we're, we're ready to begin at that point, and then the Noah's Ark thing be begins, and uh, which is a very nice thing. It was beautiful scratchboard drawings. They were probably the best drawings I ever made, and maybe 200 of them were made for that. And uh, then there's a big graveyard scene when when the uh, dead are all raised again, which is also wonderful. See, those were also dozens and dozens of very nice scratchboard drawings. Everybody is at the end. What actually happens at the end of the film is everybody's put in a teacup, because all kinds of hor really horrible monsters uh, came out of this uh, graveyard that were like animals that folded into each other. And uh, see, I'd saved all the best stuff for the end of the film, uh, and then everything is thrown into a teacup that is made out of a head. Actually, it has a so forth uh, and stirred up, and that was the real end of it. So, what we have now is just a trip to heaven and back. Yeah. For years I had made drawings and sorted them according to whether they were grill works, circles, uh, plot, you know, classif classifying them, and then they were all like numbered, and just, just that was a huge pile of stuff, because that was eventually supposed to be made into a film, uh, after there were enough of them. And, uh... It was a relief to get rid of it. The, the whole idea, see, of this, of that film originally was, say, for example, that the seats in the theater